start, I'd like to take a minute to thank everyone, all 29 people listed here who are friends of the forum. And if you wanna become a friend of the forum, you can um, go to the Minnesota Public Health Association website, mpha.net um, and sign up to be a friend of the forum. And our next slide, um, a huge note of thanks to all of our sponsors listed here. And if anyone um, wants to be a sponsor, you can talk to Mary Grant, our executive director. So our moderator for today's forum is Jaime Martinez. For 18 years, Jaime served as the Director of Community Development at Clearway, Minnesota. Jaime led efforts to strengthen the capacity and leadership of priority populations, namely African Americans, American Indian Nations, Asian American and Pacific Islanders, Chicano Latinos, the gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender, and queer communities to expand anti-tobacco movement in Minnesota. Jaime was the key in developing the Leadership and Advocacy Institute to advance Minnesota's Parity for Priority Populations, or LAMP. LAMP is a cross-cultural leadership institute that aims to eliminate commercial tobacco and other health-related disparities among priority populations through culturally tailored training, capacity building, advocacy and leadership development. Um, he also expanded tobacco control work to advance commercial tobacco-free policies on tribal lands in Minnesota. Jaime holds a Bachelor of Science and Master's of Education degrees. He has been a Kellogg Fellow in Education with the Institute for Education Leadership at the University of Minnesota and has been a Fellow in the Advocacy Institute's Tobacco Control Leadership Fellows Program in Washington, D.C. Jaime has received numerous awards, including American Public Health Association Community-Based Leadership Award, the Paul and Sheila Wellstone Public Health Achievement Award, and the Albert Justice Chesley Award for distinguished service in the field of public health. It is with great pleasure and my honor to introduce Jaime Martinez, and he will introduce our speakers for today. Jaime. Thank you uh, uh, very much, Kathy, for the nice welcome and good morning to everyone. I, I'm pleased to be your moderator today, and I beg your indulgence in my style of moderating. I'm not used to doing forums, um, but I'm really excited to uh, work, uh, do this topic. I'm glad to see there's a, a very large attendance, um, which shows that public health folks are very interested in issues uh, either to reinforce their knowledge or to learn uh, new new parts of our field and hopefully to take action as well. Um, I think that this will be a, an outstanding uh, forum. Uh, we have some really wonderful speakers today, uh, as, as uh, you saw in, in the announcements. Our forum today uh, is titled Environmental Health. Is there justice for all? But I took the liberty of um, in my mind in planning for this to call it environmental racism is there justice for all. So that was a lens that I used to uh, sort of make my notes for today. But before I, I go any further, I wanted to very quickly go over the agenda um, of how things will progress today. So um, after I make my remarks, I'll introduce the, the three panelists um, and then uh, each of the panels will have an opportunity of about, I'd say eight to 10 minutes to, to speak to, uh, or to tell their story. Uh, then uh, the, um, we'll have a panelist discussion uh, and then uh, around 8.30 and then a breakout, we'll have some breakout sessions uh, with uh, the attendees here today. And then that'll go for about, uh, Oh, about 15 minutes and then we'll come back 
uh, to the, you all will come back to the panel for Q and A. And then, and then right after that, around 920, I'll make some summary remarks. So that pretty much is the, the day for us today. And we'll try to be flexible depending on some of the questions that may be asked. And you may do that in the chat as, as well. Um, so as I indicated, uh, today we have three great uh, presenters. Uh, I'll read out their bios and then um, make a few comments about the, the topic from, from my perspective and, and tell a little bit of my story as it relates to environmental health or environmental racism. So our, today we have uh, Sharon Day uh, and I've known Sharon for quite a few years, probably over 20 years. Uh, she is the founder of the Indigenous People's Task Force, formerly known as the Minnesota American Indian AIDS uh, Task, Task Force uh, and it was the executive director since 1990. She is an en enrolled in the Boys Fort uh, Band of Ojibwe and is a second degree uh, Medawan. And I believe that, Sharon, correct me, does that relates to being a healer? Um, Ms. Day is, the, uh, is an editor of the anthology Sing, Whisper, Shout, Pray, Feminist Visions for a Just World. Uh, an excellent book, and she has written several plays that have uh, played in the in the local theaters uh, theaters here in the Twin Cities, and some of her music is recorded on the CD Nibby Walker River Songs. She has also received numerous awards, including the uh, Resource Resourceful Women Award and the Gisela Kanapka Award, um, and also has been a a fellow with the um, Spirit Aligned Legacy Fellowship for three years. Our second uh, speaker is Chao Yang. Uh, she is a, a catalyst of change and a leader with intense focus on impact. She believes strongly in building connection, collaboration, and ownership within cross-functional and cross-domain teams. Chao is currently working at the intersection of community health, uh, healthcare and organizational change efforts aimed at achieving community vitality and efforts as and efforts as a, and also as an independent consultant and public health educator with St. Paul Ramsey County Public Health. She is also the founder of the Hmong uh, Public Health Association uh, with uh, professional uh, members represented uh, from over seven states. And then our third presenter, uh, Martine Smaller, is the executive director of, of the Northside Residence Development Council. Her work is fueled by her desire to see, see her children as adults living in the community, but at an even better community than the one in which we, they were reared or raised. She has also worked for 20 years in private, public, and charter schools and founded Northside Education Alliance to see that all our urban children receive the education they need to be successful and productive members of society. Her, her uh, philosophy is simple, she says, anyone can learn. So those are our three wonderful panelists today that will have a, a great discussion. Uh, and they'll be telling us telling us their story, but before I I, I call on, on Sharon to begin uh, her story, I just wanted to add a couple of remarks that uh, surprised me. Um, since I'm this is not entirely my field, but I found it quite interesting. And um, one of the I'll read off about three factoids. Let's just say fact facts. Of, about the issue and the, and the lens that I took was environmental health uh, around uh, uh, facilities and toxic uh, facilities and waste sites. So um, one of the things that I learned is that race is the number one indicator for the placement of toxic facilities in the United States. And uh, I have a short story that relates to that. Also, environmental racism benefits uh, white folks while shifting costs to people of color and American Indians. Disregarding racism as a contributor to the health disparities ignores social history and the experience 
of afflicted individuals and communities and perpetuates inequity. And 20, according to data in 2007, more than half the people who live within 1.86 miles of a to of tough toxic waste facilities in the US were people of color. So those three facts uh, sort of perpetuated me to tell my story. And Lindsay, can you bring up your uh, uh, my slide? So we're very quickly, I grew up in South Texas and actually in Brownsville, Texas. And this is what I went to Victoria Heights Elementary School. The school uh, existed from 1921 to 2019. So this is a picture of kids that, that attended school in the last uh, data available for Victoria Heights, probably this is 2018. And when you look at this photo and it sort of takes me back to when I was in elementary, elementary school there, it looks the same. You know, uh, the majority of kids, 99% are, people, are kids of color, uh, either his, uh, Latino or indigenous uh, backgrounds. Uh, kids in the school all qualified for lunch programs. Um, poor community um, in the in, in the city, um, but, but with parents that have aspirations for their children. But little did I know growing up, because very little information was available. Uh, and and part of the story, if you'll go to the second slide, Lindsay, is that you see there the school or Victoria Heights Elementary School, it was located right next to a very huge metal and recycling facility. And it was there, uh, was put up in, 19, in the 1960s. And to this date, it's still there and it's, and it's growing. And so these kids were being exposed to all the toxins that were in that facility. And to add to, to the issue, they also had a conderator. And if um, most of you remember in Minneapolis, there's been a battle for the last 20, 25 years around the conderator along the river, Mississippi River and North. And finally, uh, I, I believe last year when there was a fire, they, they will finally be uh, shutting it down or it is shut down now at this point. But this is the environment that I grew up, grew up in and all those facilities, all those buildings around um, the school, there are residents, people live there. And I lived only three blocks away from the school, but none of us knew. And the latest uh, information I have and talking to folks down there in, the last, in this, this week is nobody ever brought up the issue of what is being emitted from these facilities because there's really no organizing around the issue. There's no information. The biggest complaint was noise from the conduit. So that's the, I wanted to set the, the tone for, for some of this work, um, for some of the, our stories today. And that, uh, and I did, I did again, think about this as environmental racism and what happens to communities that are disenfranchised and don't have the power. So with that, um, I will uh, ask our first speaker, Sharon Day, to please uh, join us and, and share your story. Uh, uh, good morning. <clears throat> I'm happy to be here this morning and um, thank you for the invite. I, um, you know, I, I worked in South Minneapolis for um, just over 30 years and um, you know, the, there is, I think it's one out of nine children are, um, uh, suffer from asthma. And <clears throat> if you look at South Minneapolis um, and, uh, you know, the air pollution there um, causes many children to be admitted to the hospital. But, you know, I want to say that, you know, right now, like if we look at the United States and we look specifically at um, uh, Minnesota and then at um, the Twin Cities uh, and across the state really, you know, we're really dealing with sort of three um, epidemics right now, three crises. And one is um, uh, racism. Uh, Hennepin County last year passed, a, um, commissioners passed a resolution saying that racism is a public health crisis. And I believe something like nine states um, have also passed that same kind of um, um, 
policy statement that racism is a public health crisis, and it is. And, um, and then we're dealing with COVID, uh, which we know is exasperating um, all of the um, health disparities that we already have. And so that if you're a black person, if you're an indigenous person, if you're a Latinx person, if you get um, COVID, um, your chances of dying from it are much higher than, than for any white person in this country. And then finally, um, we're dealing with climate change. Um, we, we are in the midst of a climate crisis. And um, you can see that, uh, you know, we were in the midst of a polar vortex, um, you know, with temperatures um, 30 below. Um, <clears throat> and um, here where I live right now in Center City, I think we had a one day we had a 31 below um, reading. And then in the South, of course, you know, they're dealing with, um, with um, snow and, and the flooding that people without, without water. And uh, so those things are real and uh, we need our public health officials to deal with these issues as, you know, it, for so long in Minnesota, you know, they, they talk about like um, health disparities and that's about all they do is talk about them. You know, that we've seen little um, uh, resources um, being put into communities that are dealing with, um, you know, with this disparity. So we can talk, talk, talk about it, but until we actually put resources in these communities, um, we're gonna continue to see um, every, every health crisis that, that comes up, um, communities of color are going to be dealing with um, the severe repercussions of, of our inaction. And um, um, just in terms of, um, also I want to speak just for a few minutes about the water. Um, you know, my people, the Ojibwe people, we came from the Eastern seaboard um, prior to contact with, um, uh, with people from Euro Europe. And, um, you know, we were uh, told to, to, to move west until we, we came to a place where food grows on the water. And I think, you know, like there, there were so many of us, uh, we were called people of the three fires, which included not only Ojibwe, but Potawatomi and Odawa. And, um, you know, it said that if you stood at a highest uh, um, peak up near the St. Lawrence Seaway in Can what is now Canada, and you look down the coast, you could see the fires of our people uh, all the way to the Carolinas. And, um, and so we were, we were a very large group of people and, um, and I think, what, why did these people, you know, because they lived as lush, right, along the seaboard, you know, lots of fish, um, a lot of the same foods that we have here, um, and, and berries, a lot of the same kind of game. Um, and, you know, we had all of that. And, and but yet we followed um, these instructions and we moved west until we came to a place where food grows on the water. Today, that food, um, which is part of our spiritual and our cultural um, birthright is being threatened by pipelines. It's being threatened by mining. And indeed, um, the entire, the largest source of fresh water is also um, being threatened by these pipelines. And, um, and if sulfide mining goes through, um, they'll, it'll even be threatened more. And one of the things that we know is that pipelines always um, have holes in them. They always become corroded, they always leak. Um, and, and those um, uh, leaks contaminate um, the water and line three crosses over 20 um, uh, rivers and waterways in Minnesota alone. Um, sulfide mining uh, will destroy our wild rice and so these are threats to, um, to not only Ojibwe people, but to all of our, you know, to one of our largest sources of water. And, um, and this is, um, uh, you know, it, it, you know, I just find it so strange that, um, you know, we're, we're, we're always willing to clean up after these um, corporations. Uh, where St. Louis River comes down from Hoyt Lakes from where I was born, near where I was born, it comes down and then it flows into Lake Superior. 
Um, St. Louis River um, has been severely impaired for ye many years, uh, largely by um, uh, U.S. steel. And so when it opens up into what's called Spirit Lake before it flows into Lake Superior, um, there's an island there, Spirit Island, that's a super hunt site. All along there, that, that water has been contaminated and that flows directly into Lake Superior, you know, one of our largest sources of fresh water in the world. So these are, you know, but we, we always seem willing to clean up the messes. And then as my, my friend, sister friend, Wynonna LaDuke says, you know, um, when my kids are small, and uh, I would tell them uh, when they made a mess, clean that mess up before you go make another mess. And yet, you know, we don't do the same thing with these large corporations. You know, we allow them to continue to uh, to make these messes. And I'll tell you this, you know, if you have a glass of water and you pour something into it, pour a little sand into it, put some salt in it, um, put some fertilizer in it. And how are you going to clean up that glass of water? So it's much easier to keep something clean than it is to try to clean it up after it's been, been dirtied. And then just finally, there are 10,000 tons of fertilizer being emptied into uh, the Minnesota River um, every year. And that is, uh, the Mississippi is fairly good until uh, the Minnesota River um, meets it at Bedoti. And that is um, every minute of every day, you know, we are um, poisoning our water through uh, our, our, our farming uh, methods, which are really unnecessary. And I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Sharon, and I'm glad you brought up the water issue. Um, uh, and just to, to mention that Sharon is a water walker. Is that the correct terminology, Sharon? Um, and she has traveled to Mississippi uh, extensively, all the way down to uh, the south. Um, my next speaker, the next speaker will be Chow. And Chow, um, welcome. And uh, if you could tell us your story and how it relates to uh, environmental health. Yes, yes. Hello, everyone. My name is Chao Ying. I am so humbled to be a part of this conversation uh, today. Thank you for the, the, the wonderful introduction, Jaime. Um, I've worked in public health and human services for over 10 years, but I started out as an organizer and I still have, you know, the community organizing mindset. Um, I think it's difficult to talk about environmental health without talking about environmental justice, which is a driving force behind the aims to account for how exposures throughout our life affects health. And so environmental health risk assessments are really built on this concept that the interactions of our systems determine our health. And racism and historical trauma clearly affect the broad range of environmental exposures and this includes social vulnerability, which is often overlooked or, or missed. And so I bring to my work my lived experiences as a Hmong American woman. And this includes experiences like being racially gaslit by my peers, feeling like a perpetual foreigner and feeling like I must diminish the pain of my people to do some of this work. Um, so my experience is very much boots on the ground, local public health work and um, and so during COVID, I have been deployed. I, I was deployed to work on COVID response in the community. And something that we're seeing is that, um, you know, Asian American data is not uh, disaggregated. Uh, and so a lot of ethnic cultural groups fall under the radar. And so something that I'm working on with the Hmong American Public Health Association and the Coalition of Asian American Leaders and Dr. J.P. Leiter at the University of Minnesota is really highlighting this, health disparities even within racial, uh, racial groupings that we are forced into. Um, and so, for example, um, due to COVID, you know, there are two, in, in 2020, there are about 205 recorded deaths um, uh, through the mortality database um, that are classified as Asian American and yet Hmong Americans make up, Hmong Americans who are mostly um, in the Twin Cities Metro, mostly in the city of St. Paul, um, make up more than half of those deaths. And so we, um, being an Asian American woman, understanding that a lot of the times our experience um, 
you know, our, our very own lived experiences um, influence the work that, that I'm doing in public health is really important to, to me. And I know that the EPA talks about environmental justice is requiring fair treatment and meaningful involvement of all people. There's still a long way to go in terms of engaging the people who are most adversely affected by social stressors that amplify vulnerability. And so I'm, I'm sure you've already heard examples like proximity to hazard Hazard, hazard, uh, hazardous land uses, fetal, a fetal exposure to maternal stress, access to parks. I work primarily in chronic disease prevention. And so access to parks is a really big issue uh, because you know, I'm working with um, community members who want to lose weight, but who want to lose weight, who want to do physical exercise and don't have space to do so, therefore really impacting um, their health for the long term. Uh, we are um, currently living in a time where zip codes still determine health outcomes, uh, which exacerbate uh, the exas exacerbate um, the racism and other factors. And where I'm particularly working is really still at the local level. And I, and I really hope that today I'm able to highlight and talk about some of the really important roles of community engagement and relationship building, what I've done and what I continue to try to do uh, to build inclusive foundations to advance environmental health and public health issues, which is all interconnected and systematic in nature. Um, my work right now is pr particularly with the Asian community and, um, and, and the Hmong community and how the community plays a pivotal role in helping uh, public health professionals like all of us to create equitable health outcomes. Um, and uh, I'll stop there. Thank you, Cho. I appreciate your, your, your story and your comments. Uh, I'll now ask uh, Martine if you could uh, please uh, address the audience and tell your story. Great. Well, thank you so much for inviting me to be here today. This is very exciting and it's a new experience for me. I'm honored to represent NERC in this forum. NERC is the Northside Residence Redevelopment Council. We're the neighborhood organization for the Near North and Willard Hay neighborhoods in North Minneapolis. Um, I'm not sure since residents are from all, I mean, since participants are from all over the state, how familiar you are with North Minneapolis, but it is the home base for African Americans. We have a high population of Native Americans, also Asian Americans and Hispanic, Latino. So we're a very diverse community and we're proud of our di diversity. And um, we, Northside has traditionally been ignored or um, intentionally maligned by the city and local government. So um, we have a very resilient and um, can-do uh, culture in North Minneapolis. Uh, so we are currently working on a demonstration site for healthy urban living. And so how we came to uh, create this entity is we were just thinking about the environmental initiatives that exist in other communities and how that they can become the norm in our community. So an example would be using a rain barrel. Um, how can we make it the norm in our community that every household um, is capturing the water off of the roof and then watering their garden or using it um, in other ways. Uh, another example would be organics recycling. Um, you know, how just participating in this um, endeavor that's already a city effort, but sometimes people just don't choose to do it. And that's a great way, of course, for uh, the food that we eat to be reused rather than to um, just go back into the landfill. Uh, so we have created this, we're still in the process of working on this demonstration site. It's at our office. And so we currently have a 750 gallon water cistern there that we use for our gar gardens. And then we will uh, eventually pump back into the house to use for gray water for toilets and for hand washing. We are in the process of implementing solar panels. Um, and then this spring, we will also implement a greenhouse a chicken coop so that residents can have experiences working with chickens, a bee apiary, and we already have a rain garden and um, po different pollinator gardens and medicinal gardens. And so what we will do is we want, we will, we'll be having uh, 
community workshops for residents in all these different, um, in, with all these different initiatives. Um, and then of course, our overall focus is to provide more avenues for residents to, to replicate these initiatives at their house and to also eat, lo eat locally, which is, um, whether you're familiar with North Minneapolis or not, we have an abundance of fast food. So a block from our office, you can go and you can have McDonald's, you can have Popeye's, you can have um, all, there's a plethora of fried chicken options. And we're here to change that narrative and um, give help residents get other options. And so we also will have gardening workshops and things like that. And so the purpose of this demonstration site is to give residents in our community opportunities to practice uh, living these, you know, using these initiatives. Um, and so say maybe somebody has always wanted to have fresh chicken eggs, but you know, they don't have the opportunity to implement a chicken coop. You know, they can come and, and volunteer or lead workshops at our site and have access to that. And then in due time, you know, when they're ready to implement that, they already have had all the experiences and they know what to do. Um, and that's the same with medicinal gardens and making tinctures and things like that. And we just moved into our site at, in 2019 and we were a little slowed down last year by the pandemic and the civil unrest. And now we're really, um, there's just a lot of momentum right now again. So as I said, this spring, we're implementing our greenhouse, our chicken coop and our bee apiary. And the way I see healthy urban living in the future is there would be um, sites like this within every six to 10 blocks where people are just picking edible um, things out of the, the gardens or the, you know, the, the bushes of the, of the site. They can come in, um, get some fresh eggs or whatever it may be. And then we're using the solar energy to um, you know, access that energy rather than being dependent on fossil fuels. This has been a very, um, like a long-term learning process for our organization and for our community. What we want to see is a new model for healthy urban living. We want to um, make that model the norm in our community. So I'll just leave it at that. Thank you, Martine. Um, so I was, um, Sharon, you made a comment that I, I agree with and that I think I'd like to go off. And that is that, is that we talk about uh, health disparities, but we do very little about that. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you all new roles. Uh, Sharon, you are now the governor of Minnesota. Uh, Chow Yang, you are the the, the Speaker of the Senate, and Martine, you are the Speaker of the House. How do we change this narrative? Because uh, I think that's where a lot of the power is. Uh, obviously, the people also uh, need to be behind you. But how would we ensure, I've seen a lot of things occur in the environment, discussions with communities, discussions with communities, and as you said, Sharon, we just can't seem to make a change. But if you all were the three major leaders in this state, what would you, what direction would you take us in? And Sharon, I'll, I'll start with you as a governor. Mm -hmm. What would you? Well, I think the, fir the first thing, um, you know, the governor could do is, um, you know, he could, um, he could stop line three. And, uh, you know, he, he, could, he could do that. He has the, um, you know, the, I won't go into all the history, but um, the Commerce uh, Department um, uh, was against line three and, um, and he directed them to, um, to uh, sort of rescind their objections. And uh, so, he, you know, he, he he, he said, um, 
you know, he wants to do the best thing for people in the state. And, you know, the best thing is to protect our water supply. And um, they just celebrated the 30th anniversary of one of the largest um, oil spills in the country. And that was at Grand Rapids, Minnesota 30 years ago. And so, you know, uh, why keep doing the same thing over and over again? And the fact of the matter is, is that, you know, we don't need um, this dirty, dirty oil um, from, from um, Canada that doesn't benefit anybody in Minnesota. It simply um, puts us at risk for damaging our water supply because that, wa that oil is going to go um, onto um, ships um, uh, crossing all the Great Lakes and then um, out, um, out of this country. So in no way does it, does it benefit anybody in Minnesota except put us at risk. So um, that's if I were the governor, that's the first thing I would do. Stop line three. Okay, great. Um, the the majority leader uh, Chow from the Senate. Well, if I were the majority leader, um, I think in order to and, and to go back to your question, in order to to stop just talking about um, to stop talking about you know, just disparities and really work towards, you know, something, a progressive outcome. I think is to acknowledge the role that the speaker plays in maybe perpetuating racism, him or herself, and to do that internal work in order to truly create policies and advocate for policies that, that, um, that will systematically change things, right? Um, I, you know, the system of racism is systematic in nature. Um, there are certain people that benefit from racism and it's a money-making system. And so in order to truly dismantle it, you, we, we have to recognize it for what it is, first of all. Um, and so, you know, racism is a driving factor behind a lot of health disparities. And so we have to understand it. We have to understand it. We have to understand what perpetuates it. We have to, um, and you know, being among American women, um, not only have I had to study it, I had to live through it. Right? <laughs> like I've had to live through racism. It's something I, um, you know, it, it's something I experience on a daily basis. I, I, I'm really well aware of how I need to navigate spaces. And so if our elected officials like the, the uh, you know, the Senate majority leader, um, you know, if, if this person does not have like the shared live experiences of, um, you know, community members who have been historically um, absent from the narrative, then how will this person actually affect anything or change anything in the future? And so um, that's where I would start. Thank you, Senator. Uh, and now, uh, Martin, you are now the majority speaker of the House. What are you going to do? Um, first of all, I was intimidated when you posed this question, so I want to acknowledge that. That even though as a child I always wanted to be president, um, the power that you just gave me <laughs> scared me. So, um, as the speaker of the House, and because I have the background in education, for me, everything starts with children and we're talking about health. So the, the, the things that came to mind right away that are threats to public health are asthma, at least in my community, asthma, hunger, um, uh, chaotic home environments, and then access to health care. Those are what, what are the, the barriers to um, public health from my perspective. And so I would use the schools, I would bolster up the schools to um, use them as an entry point where um, children, you know, starting in school, they are tested, their asthma is tested. Um, they, the, the food in the schools, I would in, drastically improve. And I would change, some schools have already started to do this, where they're growing their food or they're accessing um, fresh local food, but um, just with the basic step of having a better, 
healthy. I would want children to come to school expecting to eat good, healthy food, fruits and vegetables, um, a plant-based diet, all of that. And I would also take that as an opportunity to steer their um, palate and their, um, yes, just to steer their palate so that it's not um, just uh, the easiest, cheapest thing, um, but that they're getting the best thing when they're at school, they're getting healthy foods. Um, and then I would also look at it as a way to, coming from my background in education and Montessori education, we really see schools as um, a place to stabilize what is happening at home, almost a refuge where you're being educated, yes, academically, but the experience that you're having is so fulfilling and soothing to your spirit that it carries you even when you go home and you're dealing with stress and it gives you tools to deal with that stress. So um, I would revolutionize the school system. I would increase the number of Montessori schools and um, I don't know. I, I don't want to get too wild. So I'll just leave it with that. Thank you. So um, Governor, you, you just heard all those ideas and how do you fold them into your, what, what do they call it? Your, um, your plan, your, your legislative plan. I did hear j just before you, you go, uh, uh, Sharon, um, the, the pipeline issue or the water issue actually contaminating water. I think water is life. Uh, without water, we don't exist. I, I don't care what anybody thinks about pipelines, etc. Without water, you don't exist. And um, the way that uh, the pipeline, uh, I, I consider that also environmental racism, the way it is being uh, directed in, through the state and in other parts of the Dakotas as well. Um, and, but without water, we, we don't exist. And I think that uh, Chow touching on the issue of racism uh, is a foundation of how we then start formulating uh, equitable and just policies totally makes sense because you have to prepare that environment uh, uh, at the legislature. And Martin, essentially, you spoke about education and, and food. And when you put all these those things together, it really is the foundation to, to make change in Minnesota. And it's just about how do we, how do we accomplish that? So uh, back to the governor, what, what do you do with some of these ideas and how would you augment them? And uh, does it sound like a, a reasonable route? Yeah, I would, you know, direct then uh, direct every commissioner to figure out a way to uh, to make these things happen. And um, say, for instance, um, you know, I've got to Jan Malcolm and say, um, take a look at your department. How many people of color work there? You know, maybe start there because if, if we're, you know, for so long, um, you know, when I go to St. Paul. And, and I'm at the Capitol or the, you know, dealing with the legislators, either in the Senate or the House. You know, I served on the Clean Water Council. There, out of 30 members, there were two of us who were people of color. And that's what it looks like, you know, when you go to the Senate or the uh, legislature um, or, or any of these other governing bodies, you know. Um, you know, most of the time we're the only one or one of two people. And, um, and, and, and so how can they make, it, how can legislators, how can um, state agencies make these changes when they can't even change their own hiring practices? You know, to, um, I, I, I worked for the state of Minnesota for 10 years, um, you know, uh, and when I was younger. And, um, and I wanna say, you know, the people in my department, um, it wasn't that they were uncaring people. It's that 
so many of the times um, I'd go into a room and they'd say, well, this is what we're gonna propose. And then I would say to them, do you realize how this is gonna affect women? Do you realize how this is gonna affect people of color? And then they would take a step back and say, oh, um, okay. You know, but it just wasn't within their experience. Um, they, they, you know, they didn't live the way that I lived growing up. Um, they didn't have to deal with, um, you know, being a kid in a school where the only time they talked about native people was, um, you know, when the pilgrims came here and uh, Thanksgiving and, um, and the Indian Wars, you know, like that was it. And it hasn't changed that much. Um, our education system hasn't changed that much. So, uh, so it's not that people are uncaring, uh, although some probably are, um, but it's not within their experience. And so you have to have people who understand um, you know, what we deal with day in and day out in order to make the kind of changes we'd have. So if I were the governor, I would tell every commissioner, come back to me with a plan. Great, thank you. So we've reached the, the point where, uh, Lindsay, I think that you're at this point, you're gonna create the breakouts or you have some breakouts? Hi, this is Leah Bird. Um, as a group, we are gonna break out into small groups. So for the next 15 minutes, we will um, it, you'll break out into small groups and discuss some questions, ideas, concerns, or themes that we just kind of heard from our panelists. Um, as a group, if you could assign one individual to submit your questions to me, so send them directly to Leah Berg, and then I will submit them to our moderator for our final portion of our forum. And so Mary will, I think, will be directing you to your small groups for the next 15 minutes. And so the moderators will, the, the speakers will stay together, right? Is that correct? Yes, that's correct, Jaime. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead. This is Mary Grand, and I'm going to go ahead and open all the breakout rooms. And we will see you guys back here in the main session room uh, in 15 minutes. Thank you. How is everybody here? I'm here. Ciao and Sharon and Martine and I mean, you guys are wonderful. The comments are wonderful. I think they're provocative. I think that they are going to be um, part of the conversation that we hope is happening in the breakout rooms. That's what the forums are about, is to hear from you, have folks think and reflect on it and rather than having people shouting questions at you actually thinking about what you what they've heard and what you've talked about and what you've presented and then bring things back um, via that mechanism so um, I I just think that everything I've heard has just been amazing and and such a challenge nothing nothing has changed we just somehow, give lip service to it. I, I, I love your bluntness, Sharon, that said, you know what, we've talked about this and we're nowhere. Yeah. I love that bluntness. And I think that our public health audience is gonna love that bluntness too. <laughs> what do you think, Kathy? I think it's wonderful. And, you know, I was just noticing how many people are on our, <clears throat> you're, you're reaching a large audience with over 70 people which is probably, I know you were concerned, Angie, because March is usually a smaller group, but I think we've got even a larger group. So yes. I'm excited. And I think your calm, calm discussion is going to bring forth a lot of good, deep discussion and thought. Thank you. <laughs> and, all three of you. And, and Exactly, and to all of you, I think um, right now, Child, where, where all of a sudden we're having this terrible, ugly, awful backlash against Asian Americans and it's being reported on the news on a nightly basis. And then 
all of the additional problems that are coming through and that we're hearing about the police um, interactions between the, the Black community and also the Native American community. Things aren't so hot in all of those things. And so it just seems like we're bombarded with all of these issues and, and we don't even think that racism goes beyond those things to things like splitting up the Rondo neighborhood because that seems like the best place to put a freeway or having a metal recycling plant up in the Northeast where, you know, where Martine is and the exact same situation that Jaime grew up with all those years ago in Texas and, you know, over in